Hey there, I'm Mark. I'm one of the pastors of the downtown campus. Just want to welcome you today, and I hope you'll enjoy this teaching from God's Word. Some of you may remember the uh, World Series 2019 between the Washington Nationals and the Houston Astros. It's quite a series. Went all seven games. Anybody remember who won? Nobody cares. (laughs) The Nationals ended up winning uh, that last game and uh, the series. But something happened in that World Series that's never happened in the history of 150 years of Major League Baseball. Something so unique and unprecedented took place in that series, and this is what happened. The winner of all seven games was the visiting team. Now, just so you know like how unprecedented that is, there had never been a series where even six games was won by the visiting team until 2019, and it was actually all seven games won by the team on the road. So so there is such a thing as the home field advantage. Like, you've heard this, right? And it's more than just a slogan. It's a factual statistical reality that the advantage is to the home team. And they they win more uh, often. And it's easy to understand the reason for home field advantage. We don't have to be rocket scientists. I mean, it has a lot to do with the the crowd, the, the fan support, and sometimes that noise can really be a disadvantage for the visiting team and quite inspiring for the uh, home team. There's the uh, reality of the home turf, your own field, your own court. Maybe you understand the, the, the angle of the sun on the field at certain times or in the stadium or maybe, uh, you know, certain uh, climate. You get acclimated to wind or temperature. Different reasons why your own turf uh, can be uh, advantage for the home team, sleep in your own bed, you don't have the jet lag, you don't have uh, the fatigue, uh, things like uh, that. Another benefit is referee bias, right, where it's actually proven that uh, the refs are influenced by the home crowd, and, and you don't need a, a study on that. All you need to do is be a visiting team in Klamath Falls. That, that's, all you, that's, all you need. <laughs> that's all you need to do. Okay. So yes, there is such a thing as the home field advantage. Now, why am I talking like this? What's what's the big deal? We as believers, we as followers of Christ, we no longer have the home field advantage. We are the visiting team. We are always on the road. You're like, Mark, what are you talking about? Well, as Christians... If you haven't noticed this, the crowd, the majority of people, are not cheering for us. They're they're not on our side. Worse, they can mock us and cancel us and even target us. Now, there was a time in our country, if you were a serious Christian, you felt like you were on the home team because, generally speaking, People of faith were supported, Christ followers were supported in the public schools, supported by, by government and in the media and even in the culture and, and in the courtroom. But those days are gone. Like we're the visiting team now. We live in a post Christian culture. And, and what that means is that we no longer live in a land that holds highly the Judeo Christian worldview. So if you have strong convictions, like true Christians do, about life, about the true God, the true Jesus, sexuality, male-female gender realities and roles, if you have strong views about those things, things like true justice, not just what anyone wants to call social justice, strong convictions about personal responsibility, God's absolute truth in the Bible, human depravity, how to be saved, I can go on and on. All of those things and more, 
have relegated us to the visiting team. We've lost the home field advantage. Now, I'm not trying to be fatalistic. I'm just being realistic. And Jesus talked about this. In his prayer, and this, what I want to do here, just give you an intro before we get into our text. This is kind of a pep talk from Jesus to the visiting team, us. And in his prayer to, to the Father on the night before he died, John 17, 14, he says, I have given them, that would be us, your, your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Now check this out also. In addition to that, Jesus says in chapter 15 of John, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world or visiting team. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So Jesus clearly says that we have always been on the road when it comes to our faith and living that out here in uh, the world. Let me quickly summarize what Jesus is saying here, just four quick points by introduction and it can't take a lot of time on all these things, but he talks about um, really the definition of winning. A lot of crazy definitions of what Christian thinks, Christians think it means to win in the culture. So this is what Jesus says. First, don't be like the world. He's very clear on that, that yeah, we're, we're in it, but don't be of it. He prays that, that we'll, we'll be protected from uh, the evil one, that we'll be sanctified by the truth of God's word. See, a lot of people think that you're, you win as a Christian by blending in to the world, becoming like a chameleon. Just change your colors based on your environment. That's, that's compromise. That's not, that's not winning. Okay, That's getting walked on. That, that, that's not what it means... Uh, to win. We want to be different because we're lovers of Jesus, not like uh, the culture. It's okay to be relevant, but not in a way that it ever compromises the truth of what God says in his word. Number two, don't leave the world. And so that would be the temptation of other Christians. Like, we, we're never going to win. Why even try? And so let's build a fortress. Let's just hunker down and and distance ourselves and stay away from sinners. The big problem is that's not what Jesus is teaching us here. He's teaching us to be in the world. He says, as I have been sent by the Father, so, so they have been sent. That's us. So same purpose, to have, to have a sense of penetration into the world, not a distance from it. And then three, here's the main point, seek to save the world. John 12, 47, Jesus adds this, If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. So Jesus is saying, yes, judgment is coming. There is a judge. But he says, that's not why I came. I came to save this is important because our primary win as Christians, our game plan, is to proclaim the good news of Jesus. No matter how bad things get, no matter how much we're hated, no matter how crazy certain godlessness or laws or mandates, whatever, whatever it might be, we are here not to judge the world. That's God's job. We're here to bring people to Jesus. We're not primarily fighting culture wars. We're not primarily trying to win political battles. We're not primarily trying to get the home field advantage back. Now, it'd be wonderful if that were to happen. But those are the effects of the gospel. Those are not the gospel. Those are the effects. And so we see here number four, lastly that it's about being salt and light in the world. 
where Jesus says in Matthew 5 that by our lives, that there should be a difference that, that we make, that because we work somewhere or live in a certain neighborhood, that, that should make a difference and have an impact on um, other people, okay? Our main goal is not to change the culture, it's to bring people to Jesus, and then we hope as a result, the culture will be different. Very, very important. Now, our passage today sort of builds on this, and, uh, and I know it's just a real quick overview, but very important that we see what Jesus means by winning as the visiting team. This text builds on it, Philippians chapter 3, and so our title today is Winning on the Road, and we're in Philippians chapter 3. Now, I want to say before I, before I forget that, that we're on the greatest team ever. We're on God's team, it's our champion Jesus running the offense and the defense and everything else. We, we, have, we have the greatest team ever, the Church of the Living God, and we know how it ends. We win. Okay, because we're with King Jesus, he's coming back, he is going to right all wrongs, and we're going to rule and reign with him. Okay, so that's where this is all going. I am not, you know, being fatalistic at all. I'm excited, it's an exciting day to be alive, but it's true, we're on the road. We're the visiting team. But we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. So, we know we win in the long run, but how do, you, how do we win today? How do we win this next week in our everyday lives? That's what this is about here uh, today. Big idea is how to win for Jesus on the road. And there's three simple things we see here in this text. First, the right team. The right team. We need examples of Jesus in our lives. Verse 17, Paul says, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. So he's saying we need the right team and the right team dynamics, which include being examples for each other, just like any team. You have a bad apple on a team, and that can take the whole team down. You need good examples throughout uh, the team, as well as uh, team leaders. Paul says, follow me. That's heavy. He says, not me, okay, but follow my life, Paul says. As I follow Christ, he says it in a couple other places, like uh, 4.16 of 1 Corinthians, I urge you to imitate me, and 11.1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, Paul is not um, bragging. He's not putting himself on the pedestal. He's very clear in Philippians that he doesn't have it all together, and he has uh, growing areas. Still, he's able to say, Follow my example as I follow uh, the example of Christ. We need others in our life that we can see Jesus in them. I want to talk about this for just a minute. As human beings, we have been wired to be highly influenced and impacted by people around us, right? It's just a human reality. This, and God, does, God has designed it uh, this. Now, of course, this can go way negative, but God has designed it for positive. We learn best by watching and modeling, right? It's especially true as uh, believers. Uh, people who will show us Jesus in real time. Very important. And this is one of the most proven methods of behavior Formation, behavior modification is uh, watching others. Like if you're trying to learn something, like how to do something, maybe you don't know how to do it, you could read a book, like that's one way to learn, or you could watch somebody, right? You watch, or a YouTube video, praise God for YouTube video. Not all of them, just the how-to, you know, <laughs> the how-to ones, um, because it's just that's it's kind of wired that way. We see it, and then it's more caught um, than, than, than taught. This is my life story. I've told you this before, all the way back to when I was a little kid. Uh, my parents are wonderful, not perfect. They had strengths and weaknesses, but God has always had people uh, to, to, to teach me and show me, kids, adolescents, uh, young, young married, uh, parenting, at every step in the ministry, at every step, uh, not perfect people, but Jesus people, uh, further along than, than me for sure, uh, 
and still to this day, people in my life, game changer for me because of seeing Jesus uh, in, uh, in others. Now, I want to say that no person can be that absolute example. There's no like one, because Jesus isn't here walking, living on the earth. So there's no like, oh, well, that's my mentor. You know? um, we need a, a, a team. And this is what the church is, uh, is, is all about. Because how it, how it typically uh, goes down is since nobody has all the qualities, uh, and because we all have weaknesses and areas of, of struggle, uh, we see things in others like, oh, man, the way that, man, that, that, I want to be a husband like that guy. Or, or man, the, the way that they, they, they just, like, love people in such an amazing... Or maybe the, the way they are on the job. I want to be a Christian like them on uh, the job. Or maybe the way that they're going through adversity and suffering. Man, they show me a lot about what it means uh, to, to be uh, more like Jesus. Or how they handle money and possessions because you know they have a lot of that and it's just a blessing and how they uh they don't they're not owned uh it, it doesn't own them you know or whatever it might be these ways that we can see Jesus in these other uh, situations as well as learning from their weaknesses we tend to you know criticize gossip about weaknesses find that dirt on people it's way better just to learn from it just learn from it. Now, this is where life group becomes so vitally important. Life group is way more than a program here. It's simply a way to get people together so that all kinds of different people, different parts, different places on the journey, some not even Christians yet, potentially, to see Jesus in other people. And, and, and if you're not in a group, then you're missing one of the greatest opportunities for this to happen. We talk about, oh, I want to see Jesus. We sing songs. Oh, I want to see, see Jesus. Jesus is most often seen in his body, the church. So I was reflecting on life group just for me personally, and I was sort of going down. It took maybe five minutes. It didn't take long. I could, I could have spent a lot of time on this. But I think you'll get the gist of what I'm talking about. Just in the group last spring that I was a part of, um, he, here's some stuff. Just a very normal group. Like we're not like superstars by any means. Um, this, is, this is what I, and I'm not going to name any names, okay? But I'm thinking of a person who's a new believer, and they're just on fire. And they just, you know, got that zeal for God, and I'm inspired by that. I'm also thinking of a person who's really been hurt by Christians and the church, and this person's just starting to open up again. And that's been encouraging to me to see what God's doing in that person's life. And I'm thinking of a person who is so bold at their work. They love to share Jesus uh, on the job. And, and, and that is motivating to me. I think a, there's a person who's a leader in a position in our community that is very difficult. People of all different uh, views on things, and I am blessed at watching this person lead. There's a person, and just the way they love people, because I don't love people as well as I should, and so I'm blessed and motivated by how they uh, do that. There's uh, people, hospitality, love to open their home, love to serve and just do projects uh, for the Lord. I'm thinking of someone right now who's, whose heart is just for the hurting and the broken and the wounded, and mine often isn't. Mine is more like, hey, suck it up. You know? uh, uh, and to see that, and I need to go more in that uh, direction. I'm thinking of someone, they look me in the eye. I'm the only one in the world when they're talking to me, and that's how I want to be. Oh, and the same person, greatest giver I know. They just love to give. I'm thinking of a person who is a leader in our community and quite influential, but so humble and down to earth. And as a leader, I'm blessed by that kind of example. It, guys, I can go on and on. And, and this, is, this is what we can see when we're with Jesus' people so here, in, actually next week, sign-ups for the fall life group season, 10 to actually 12 weeks, is next week, and these life groups start in about a month. And, and, and this is a great opportunity. 
get plugged in. Take that step. Again, we're going to give you that opportunity uh, next week. Also, just a quick shout out for the kids ministry, uh, youth ministry. This is what it's about. We need all the help we can get with our kids, get, getting them with other people um, that love Jesus in their lives. Youth group, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, camps, children's ministry. This stuff is really really important. Now, there's something else here. It's not just having examples that we can follow. It's also being an example. To personalize this ourselves, because what's Paul doing here? Paul's like, hey, follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Like, can we say that? We should be able to be in the place in our life where we can. 1 Timothy 4.12 Paul says to young Timothy, don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. So you be an example in all these areas, even though you're young. It's vital we understand that our relationship with Jesus is not just personal. It's very much relational. Our lives ripple out. In other words, we're an example, like it or not. The question is, what kind of an example are we? And when a Christian says, maybe you've heard this before, oh, don't follow my example, follow Jesus. That's understandable, but it's not biblical. What's biblical is what Paul says, follow my example as I follow Christ. You know why I think some Christians say that? Oh, don't follow me, follow Jesus. It's a cop-out. Spiritual laziness. Oh, I love to be saved. I don't, I don't want to change. I don't want to become like Jesus. And so to be able to, to say, oh, man, I'm trying to follow Jesus. Follow me as I follow Jesus. So important. And others as well, Paul says. It's not just about him. Other people. That's why this is so much a team thing. And Jesus had some pretty strong words about being a bad example. Here's one example, Matthew 18, 6. If anyone, he says, causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Whoa. Again, negative example. That should get our attention. And then keep reading verse 18. Paul says, For as I've often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So not a lot of time we have on this, but basically not just the good examples, but to be aware of negative examples. Not, not that we're, we're never going to hang out with you. We're not looking down on them, you know, but we're, just, we're learning from the negative examples, right? See, cause you, if you don't know this, the people that we hang with, if we're not careful, they will influence us, even subtly. And, and so, again, it's, it's, just, it's just loving them, but just making sure that we're gleaning off the uh, godly qualities and not uh, the negative. And this leads us to number two, where uh, if we're going to win as the visiting team, then we're going to need to have the right performance, right? It makes sense. Like, like the better team, if the better team is a visiting team, they typically win. Here we read how to guarantee losing, right here, verse 19. This is how we can guarantee losing, like this next week in our relationship with Jesus. Verse 19, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame, and their mind is set on earthly things. That sounds like social media to me. <laughs> that sounds like Christians going at it on social media. It's like kind of missing the point. First, that God is their stomach. That's the idea. It's all about our appetites, our desires, based on self-satisfaction. Just do what feels good. Just do what your gut says. So, you know, if you want to leave your marriage, no problem if it makes you happy. Uh, you know, if you want to be sexually active before the wedding... No problem. Everybody sins anyway. Uh, you know, if you don't want to serve in God's church, you don't want to be committed, you don't want to be part of the fellowship, that's okay because you just need to be free to do whatever you want to do and just be comfortable. See, these are the things 
that are really about our own appetites and desires and have no place in the follower of Jesus. They glory in their shame. In other words, they're bragging about things like their arrogance and their greediness and materialism and their selfishness and anger and retribution, bragging about that stuff. It says their mind is on earthly things. That's convicting. Thinking more about the world's values and standards, more about the world's praise, the world's stuff, the world's fun. We're thinking about those things more as a priority in our lives than the things of God. Our minds on earthly things. That's what it means to live as an enemy of the cross is what he says here. Jesus died to save us from these things. Not just to forgive us, but to save us out of this kind of living. And there's a beautiful illustration of this in the book of Daniel. Let me just share this with you quickly. You got, you got there at 600 B.C., the Jewish nation gets overthrown by Babylon. Babylon comes in and dominates Judah. And what they do, so, so these four teenagers, this is the story of Daniel, these four teenagers, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they get taken out of their land to Babylon. And the whole goal is an indoctrination process to make those four teenagers and many others, some of the finest of Israel, to be fully Babylonian. It was their way to best conquer a people is to try to take some of their young leaders and get them to think and become the way that they are, Babylonian. You guys follow me? So that's what was going on. So they take these four teenagers, and, and these, these guys, these four, they did submit themselves to that process. They went to the king's school. They took the king's job but they knew where to draw the line in the sand. And so when they were told, no, now you need to do this, and now you need to bow to this, and now you need to like, eat this kind of food, whatever it might have been, they said, oh, no, 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 we can't defile our God. It's such a beautiful picture, and they were nice about it. They weren't jerks. They're just like, hey, there's a line. They knew where their line was in the sand. And that's when they had to compromise their biblical convictions. They're like, we can't go there. We've made up our mind. If you think we're going to go there, you're out of your mind. Like, we'll live in your land and follow you know, your laws as long as they don't obey God's law. We'll be your best workers and we'll be good citizens. But our ultimate allegiance is to our God. Not your gods, not your king, not any of your stuff. We've made up our mind. And they say to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in chapter 3, you might remember the story, uh, you guys got to bow down to this God, this statue. They're like, we can't do that. We believe God's going to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. Like, like, like they say, you're going to get thrown into the fire. They're like, if you guys got to do what you got to do. We're not going to bow down. Today we might hear, you're going to get fired in various ways if you don't do something that contradicts maybe a, a spiritual convic conviction. Then later in chapter 6, the government says to Daniel, don't pray anymore. Stop praying. So what does Daniel do? He goes home. And he goes completely undercover, and he prays just in his mind. Is that what he did? No, oh, he threw his windows open, and he hit his knees. And he, he not just goes public because he was already out there publicly. He just did exactly what he did before. And, and it should be clear, it's a great picture, we should represent Jesus in this community. Not in an angry way or a condemning kind of a way, but in a very real, like we're, we're outward about it. We're not undercover secret Christians as this world is trying to silence us, discredit us, keep your faith to yourself, keep it inside your church, close your windows. Daniel says, no, I worship the Lord without apology. And in every case in the book of Daniel, God honored that. 
God showed up. There in chapter 3, when they, got, they did get thrown in the fiery furnace. And remember, remember what happened? The fourth man showed up in the fire. Hey, who is that? It's probably Jesus or an angel. We don't know. But I mean, God showed up and saved them. And then with Daniel, don't pray. Daniel, I'm going to pray. Windows open on my knees. <laughs> And so they throw him in the lion's den. Where was God? There in the lion's den, keeping the mouth shut. Okay, he showed up. Now, don't, don't, don't think that every time that God's going to keep us out of a problem, we're a consequence. Like, there are Christians being killed today in various parts of the world. And that's God's plan for them today. You could lose your job by holding to your conviction in various jobs in our community. Just make sure it's a scriptural conviction. Not just because you don't like the politics or something. Make sure it's a biblical conviction. So I love this about these guys. They drew the line. They were devoted to the Lord. They're like, the Lord and his word are true. He's our ultimate authority, not government, not the boss, not celebrities, definitely, not, you know, any of that. Your friends, it's the Lord. He's the one we follow. So the right team, the right performance, and then finally, number three, the right home. We gotta, we gotta have the right home mentality because we're citizens of heaven, verse 20. That's where our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Citizens of heaven. Guys, that word citizenship, it's the Greek word polytuomai. What does that sound like? Politics. That's where we get the word politics. You understand what this is saying? Our politics are in heaven. Okay, that's a good reminder. We may be politically involved. It's not wrong here in this culture. But our main politics are kingdom of God. Jesus as our king. And we are citizens of heaven who live here on temporary assignment. That's why the Bible calls us foreigners, strangers, aliens. The Bible calls us ambassadors. We're the visiting team. It's like the church is the Jesus embassy. That's a great picture of the church, by the way. The embassy of Jesus. That's why what we're doing here is so important. Because we come together for encouragement, teaching, strength, so we go out and do our jobs on mission to represent Jesus well in this culture. We're not angry at it. We're not looking down on it. We're not being jerks about it. We're like Daniel. We're pretty cool about it. But we also know where the line is in the sand. Now, if you've traveled internationally, you, you get this, right? If you travel, you travel as an American. And a lot of times when we're out in these different countries, if you have, if, you know, depending on the country and what they have to offer, you're like, man, I'm homesick for America. I want my own bed. I want the food. You know, I want the roads, whatever it might be. That's, that's understandable, and that's good. Nothing wrong with being homesick as an American. Uh, same reality as Christians. We should be homesick for our true home in heaven. And it says we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus. I love that. We're not, we're not just excited about the coming of the Lord. We're excited about the Lord who's coming. Big difference. It's him. It's Jesus. And don't miss this, new bodies. Yeah, yeah, a lot of us ready for that. The kind of body Jesus had. And he just sort of walked through walls, and he disappeared here and showed up over there. No disease, no disability, no death, right? None of that stuff, no diet. <laughs> new bodies, man. Instantly, when Jesus comes. And his power, it says, is going to bring everything under his control. I'm ready for that. 
King Jesus, who's going to right all wrongs, and we're going to rule and reign with him. So we're talking about that mindset of where our real home is. Just like when you're playing an away game, you know that this is not the home field. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We may be here in the minority right now, the visiting team, but good news, the game's not over. We will win. There is a home city. There is Jesus Nation watching us right now, cheering us on right now. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Did you guys know that? It's like the, the crowd in heaven right now, the fans cheering you on, watching your Christian life. And it says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. It's like, let's get after it. Let's Let's get rid of the stuff that's slowing us. Let's get the this, this sin, all known sin, confessed and out of our lives. Why? Because we have a race to run. We have a life to live for Jesus. It says we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. There you go, guys. All of heaven's watching. Mainly Jesus, his eyes, like we talked about last time, focused on him and what he has already done. He laid down his life for us, our champion, so then we gladly lay our lives down for him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this reminder about our citizenship today where our ultimate loyalty lies where our home is, and that, that's a painful reality at times as we're here as the minority, the visiting team, but this is exactly what you said, and it's exciting to live this way because we know we're victorious uh, because of you and through you, and I pray that we would uh, be about the work of the Jesus Embassy in this community, making a difference. And I, I especially pray that everybody here has a passport of heaven. That everybody here is a citizen of heaven. If you're not sure, if the blood of Jesus is not stamped in that passport, then today you could know for sure that your sins are forgiven, that Jesus is your Savior, and that you're a Christian. You just say, Jesus, come into my heart, please. Save me. Forgive me. I need you. If you just prayed that and you meant it in your heart, the Bible says all who call upon Jesus will be saved. It'd be great to let somebody know today there's a card in the chair back in front of you. You can put prayer requests and you can even check the Jesus box. It says, yeah, I'm a follower. I, wanna, I want you to know. Pray for me. I just trusted Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I, I don't know uh, who just prayed that, but you do, and I, I pray that they would understand and grow in their faith. And I pray that all of us would be further along because of what you've uh, taught us today. And we now trust you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, to do your work in our lives. Amen.